So welcome to our, I think this is our third annual, but not really annual because of COVID, She Talks, which is a really fun event that followed our Women Who Create conference. So this afternoon we had women in the training room um, celebrating Women, Ent women Entrepreneurship Week. Um, had some just really inspiring, great stories and great sessions this afternoon. And this is sort of the finale of our event today. We have six nervous, uh, prepared, maybe, um, exciting speakers that will tell their story in a format called Pecha Pecha, which if you've never seen the format, their slides that they had to submit to us, 20 slides, will go automatically for 20 seconds. So those of you who have done public speaking, it's a little challenging format, um, but it makes it fun and exciting. And we have just some wonderful lineup of people here to present tonight. I know all of them, and, and I know you're going to be inspired. Um, this event is made possible by the Ivy College of Business. So I would like to welcome David Spaulding, um, who is our sponsor of She Talks. So big round of applause for him. Uh, thank you, Judy. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, it's really a pleasure to sponsor this. We've sponsored it all three years. Uh, it's really always one of my favorite events of the year. Love hearing. No pressure. Love hearing these ladies uh, in, in their uh, with their great stories. So, uh, so the Ivy College of Business. I mean, we are uh, a college on the move. A lot of great things happening with us. Uh, new majors that we're uh, we're launching. Uh, we're launching a human resources major uh, next year. This is going to bring in the human side of business into the Ivy College of Business. So we're really excited about getting that major launched. Uh, we're launching some programs in healthcare uh, management undergraduate major in healthcare management, uh, master's degree in healthcare analytics and operations. So we're excited about moving into the healthcare field. Uh, we have had a, a strong push on to recruit more women for our faculty, more women for our uh, undergraduate and graduate programs. Uh, this year our incoming group of freshmen, almost 40% uh, women, uh, which is a high watermark for us. Uh, still more work, uh, more work to be done. From a faculty standpoint, uh, we've grown to the point where we have the highest percentage of women uh, faculty of any school or college of business in the Big 12, and it's always good to be number one in the Big 12. <laughs> On our way to number one in the Big 12 in football starting Saturday, or continue <laughs> Saturday. So, uh, so, again, really wonderful to be with you all tonight, and I'm looking forward to the speakers. Yay! of each of our speakers, their bios are in your program. Um, we're going to bring up Amanda Severson, who is our first speaker, and then we will move on to the next two before we take a break. So, Amanda, thank you. Come on up. Is this working? Mm -hmm. yes. That works better. Yes. Seahawks did not hire me full-time, ouch. 
uh, and I needed a new job. So I was looking for sports jobs all across the country, but no one was hiring that year. And it was then that the LPGA called, Ladies Professional Golf. They told me that they had a role that was located in Daytona Beach, Florida. And I thought, okay, two years of sunshine and beaches, I can totally do this. <laughs> But then on the second phone interview, they said, actually, actually, we, we want to make sure we clarify, this is a temporary role that's located in a different state, and that is, drum roll please, <laughs> Iowa. What? Are we really doing this, God? Like, I don't even know where Iowa is on a map. But no other jobs were working out, no other doors were opening, and so I decided I better take God's plan this time around. And I moved to Iowa in March of 2016. When I got to Iowa, I realized that this is a pretty big agriculture state. And all of a sudden, all the perceptions I had around food and all the flashy news headlines I was following were not very well received by the Iowans. Uh, and every weekend, I was going to the farm boy's farm, and I was trying to do farm stuff. And gosh, that was hard and complicated, and I kind of sucked at it. <laughs> uh, but as I was starting to do it more and more, I was falling in love with it. I was falling in love with food, not just the taste of it, but how hard people work to get it to your plate. I was asking questions, I was doing research, and the more I found out, the more I loved it. Also, the more I found out, the more I loved the Iowa farm boy. So, we did what any good couple does, we went into business together as boyfriend and girlfriend. <laughs> He started to figure out how to raise the beef, and I was figuring out how to sell the beef. We were taking out operating loans and had debt together before we even signed the marriage license. I highly recommend it to all of you couples. In the <laughs> so now it's the summer of 2017, and we go to our first farmer's market. And besides the fact that we didn't actually raise this beef, his parents did, and our marketing class sucks, uh, we do fairly well. We sell some beef, but we're constantly getting asked the question, is this grass-fed meat? And our answer is, uh, no, duh, we live in Iowa, this is corn-fed beef. But they didn't like that answer very much. So, uh, we get married that summer, and we decide that we're gonna do an experiment because we're getting so many questions. So we raise six is grass-fed and six is corn-fed, and we commit to doing whatever path leads to the most success. And so as we go down this journey, what do you think wins? Yeah, of course, grass fed wins. Not what we were expecting, but uh, we go to the next farmer's market the next season and we sell out of the grass fed at $2 more per pound than the corn fed. And actually, the corn fed sells so poorly that we don't actually sell it all and have to take it to a sale farm. And along the way of this process, we're falling in love with raising grass fed. So why did we fall in love with it? Well, those six corn-fed beef that we had, they had more vet costs combined than the 150 grass-fed steers we've raised to date. The animals were healthier and happier, and it was better for the environment. We were seeing the research that grass-fed was capturing carbon that had, had net negative emissions. So we dive headfirst into grass-fed, and that's where we are now. And I'm proud to say that over the last four years, we have fine-tuned our operation, and I truly believe we have some of the best grass-fed beef in the entire nation. That's because of our rotational grazing, our humane handling practices, the genetics, and more. We work very, very hard to get that grass-fed meat to your plate. How do we sell it? Well, we sell it at farmer's markets, we sell it online, we ship boxes weekly on dry ice, we have our wholesale partners, and people love it, it tastes amazing. But they don't just buy it because it tastes good, they buy it because of our story. Because from the beginning, we committed to share our story and our process completely transparent, transparently. Why is that? because I didn't want people to feel judged for not knowing about agriculture like I did. I wanted to pe people to feel like they could ask any question that they had and that we would welcome them in with open arms and show them our business openly. And we love doing that with people. How do we do it with people? There's lots of ways like our farmer's markets are online, but honestly the most successful way has been our Instagram. Every single day we're sharing the highs of the highs the lows of the lows with everyone and we're even doing a little bit of dancing which you've already got a preview to um, so what exactly uh, does dancing have to do with selling beef 
Um, it might seem silly to all of you, and it does seem silly to us as well, but dancing actually helps people buy beef. Yeah. <laughs> it just take a while. Okay, so this video that you see behind me uh, ended up on national TV in the Applebee's commercial. <laughs> and even though it seems silly, in a time where beef is being victimized for being bad for the environment or that people shouldn't eat it, all of a sudden we changed the narrative, being a happy couple dancing in front of cattle and we got to show agriculture on a stage. That has opened so many doors for us, like this one here tonight. We have the opportunity to get on stage and tell people that eating beef is healthy and nutritious, and they should totally be feeding their kids it. <laughs> and also, when they're feeding their kids it and themselves, they should feel good about it because it's good for the environment. So, in summary, this was not exactly what I expected for my life, far from it. But God had much, much bigger plans for me, and I'm so glad that he did. Because he knew I needed a passion that challenged me and was outside of my comfort zone. And now I have the best job in the world. I get to raise beef, and I get to show people why it's so important that they know who their farmer is. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Nadelia Gomez, and I am the Chief Technology Officer for the Digital and Precision Ag Biosciences Platform. That is a new role, not only for me, but also for the university. And every single day I'm working on that role, I'm reminded of my two childhood heroes, Kermit the Frog and Norman Borlaug. <laughs> Kermit the Frog for me was the original empathetic leader, a little bit anxious, a little bit of a worrier, but trying to lead a whole bunch of talented individuals, the Muppets, to a shared goal. And Norman Borlaug. I mean, I really just wanted to be Norman Borlaug. He was the plant breeder that made the connection between developing plant varieties and solving world hunger. And I wanted to be a plant breeder. I wanted to grow a seed that I could plant overnight, feed four families the following day. Every single part of the seed would be edible. I mean, you get the idea. But I'm getting ahead of myself, so I have to start with the very beginning. I was born and raised in Panama, Central America, a densely populated modern city in the middle of the tropical rainforest. And my family appreciated curiosity, creativity, science, education, and I was really good because I was a very curious child, always asking questions. In fact, one of my first memories as a child was fourth grade science class. We were learning about unicellular organisms. Yay for dinoflagellates! <laughs> and the teacher says, all right, are there any questions? And of course, I had nothing but questions. Up goes my hand and I ask my question. And the rest of my classmates, <gasps> of course, I was the only thing between them and recess. But my science teacher knew what to do dismissed the class, gave me a lot of books, and here I was just diving into science. And that was really important because science is all about asking questions and practicing how to ask those questions is absolutely important. We don't come naturally designed to ask the right questions. So we have to practice how to do that. And there's experimental design that goes into it and statistics, and all of this helps us uncover the mysteries of the natural world. Now, there are some questions that are very personal that cannot be answered with science. And I asked my dad, how do I choose a career? Guess what? He answered with two questions. What do you like to do? And what is a problem worth solving? I knew I was passionate about science, and there was no bigger problem than world hunger, Norman Borlaug. And so I decided to follow the steps of Norman Borlaug, traded my tropical home for the not so tropical home, and learned a lot of new things, but it was difficult. I left my family behind. In fact, a lot of my closest relatives died in that period of time as they aged. And that rubber ducky that sits on top of my computer that was called the stay afloat ducky. And it would move about the different tables of our office mates whenever we needed to take care of each other. It sat on my desk a lot, and it was very, very difficult. 
But there were also some encouraging moments. I actually got to meet Norman Borlaug. And I was part of the student delegate that would meet with him wherever he would come to visit the University of Minnesota. And we had really close conversations. At one time, he was telling me how he had never set out to be a Nobel Prize laureate. That wasn't even in the mindset. It was all about taking the next steps. First it was graduating, then it was finding a job so that he could sustain his growing family, then it was taking that trip to Mexico to teach others how to grow plants. And so for me that was really influential because I thought I was just gonna step right into his footsteps. It wasn't that case. By the time I was ready to go into the workforce, the environment of agriculture had been transformed by digitization. All of us are carrying now in our hands or in our pockets a high computational device that is able to run tremendous analytics. That was not the case when Norman Borlaug started. And so for me, being able to step into that space meant figuring out what projects that I needed to work on. And that was very scary because there were a lot of infinite possibilities and I worried that I would make the wrong choice. What if I went on that project when all these other four were the ones that were going to transform science? Well, luckily I stopped worrying about making the wrong choice because in reality, many people in the past had tried to predict things. That's a clip from a newspaper in 1915 or something like that. And God, sometimes wrong, sometimes right, but it's not about being able to be right all the time. It's really about finding the relationships and the connections between people so that we are prepared in the future to address really big, complex, wicked problems. And that's what I did. I started to connect ag tech entrepreneurs <coughs> with well-established ag industry leaders. And the idea was we won't be able to figure out what's going to happen. We're only going to be able to prepare the next generation of entrepreneurs that can solve some of these problems. And for me, digital agriculture isn't only going to give us a solution for more high yielding crops. It goes beyond that because we have the data and the analytics that will help us unlock better mechanisms to take care of our planet. Maybe even understand some of the inequalities that are in food. And so in general, for me, working across these different spaces meant always being in an uncomfortable zone where I didn't know enough about anything. I was in agriculture, in technology, in business development, and it was that in-between ground where making those questions and asking the right questions was really important to get things connected. So it reminds me so much of that early stage where science was my superpower, and I really hope other people to find that opportunity to ask the questions, develop that scientific experience of resilience. I've kept on learning, now I'm back in school hoping that business can be my next superpower, and every time I pass by the Jardine Business Building, I see this mural, and I am reminded that I belong and that it is the diversity of ideas and backgrounds that will help us move forward, not only solving world hunger, but addressing some of the biggest challenges of humanity. Thank you. How do you follow solving world hunger? Especially when you're just Ignite Yoga. Hi everyone, I'm Emily from Ignite Yoga, and I'm here to share my journey to health and wellness, and also uh, reinforce the idea of powerful, far, supes, far, far supersedes pretty. Um, and I'm gonna start with my picture of my daughters as I went through all the pictures to come up with these 20 slides. And 99% of my pictures were of my daughters. And so that kind of shows you where my journey began. As a mom, there's zero pictures of me. So here is me as a four year old. <laughs> I look kind of sad, right? And that honestly was a dark part of my life. Um, my parents were going through a divorce. And I think I, it um, honestly like brings in a point of, it's a seated point of insecurity and unsureness. And now I show you my beautiful, pretty sister, Christy. She's the one on the left, I'm the one on the right. Um, and all of my life, she was always more celebrated, not within our family because she was beautiful, um, she was also smart and talented, but the world gave her far more attention. And so as a younger child looking up to her, 
I had deep-seated insecurity. So I'm going to go on to my next couple slides. This is my daughter, Sunny. The next couple slides, again, are of my kids. Um, and fast forward to my life as a mom. So as a mom, my life was baking cookies, taking my kids to soccer, going to yoga, or taking them to swim class. Um, they didn't do yoga. Um, and that's Libby, isn't she so cute? I lost myself, and when I looked in the mirror, I realized I was tired, and I had no sense of who I was as a, win as a woman. And so that leads me to my next slide, which is a picture of me, which will come up after my first 13.1. I signed myself up for a, for a half marathon to challenge myself. And what I noticed was my body was beginning to transform and I was getting more attention as a woman because of the way I looked. I looked in the mirror and actually I could wear jeans the same size as my sister. So I felt pretty good about myself. This is me with my daughters, and, but they were actually there to see it all, young girls. And so then it became eat, sleep, run. Eat, sleep, run. That's what I did. That was my repetition because I thought the more I ran, the better I would feel. The more physical attention that I got, the better the world would be, the happier I would be. But my body started to pay the price of it. And I noticed that my body was fatigued and actually I was more tired than ever, which led me to my first yoga class with Kathy Vince. This is Kathy. I went to my first yoga class thinking that I was going to stretch my body. That was my goal. But as I was looking around, I didn't know what I was doing, and I was really concerned how I was looking. And Kathy whispered to me, don't worry about how it looks. It's about how it feels. There set the tone of my journey with yoga. Love, Kathy Vicks. And then I began going to yoga more and more, and I realized that not only yoga was transforming me, stretching my body and giving me a sense of um, stretch, it was stretching my mind. I was breathing more, I was more aware of my surroundings, and I actually was far more happier. So, insert my brother-in-law, James. James is a badass, I'm not gonna say it. All right, I can't say it more. Marathons, golf, surf, whatever it is. He's like, you gotta try hot yoga, you'll love it. So on a visit to California, he's like, all right, we're gonna go to this class. 90 minutes, 105 degrees, 26 poses, and my ass was kicked and my mind was transformed. <laughs> Knew that that was a passion. So I came back to Iowa. This is me running at Ada Hayden, still a passion for me. And I was thinking to myself, all right, this is it, Emily. You have one chance. You can either do this now or you'll miss it. You have the chance to not only change your lives, but the opportunity to change the lives of others. You need this for yourself. And so, even though I was full of self-doubt, that sad child was definitely reminding me and creeping in with all of my insecurities, my sister came to visit, the beautiful one, the pretty one. And she said to me, she's the one that told me to do it. So I signed myself up for a 200-hour teacher training. And what I didn't realize is that my time away from my family was actually doing great things for my kids. They stopped looking for me for answers and they figured stuff out on themselves. And so it was not only a challenge for me, but the challenge for my family. And this is the bare bones of Ignite Yoga. This is what it came down to. I came back from teacher training and realized, okay, I gotta get a plan together, I gotta get a logo, I gotta go to the bank for a loan, all by myself without anybody else. And also hire teachers and hey, remember, you gotta teach some classes, so I had to practice some classes too. And then this is my community. They bring me so much joy. It wasn't for me, if it wasn't for the community, I wouldn't be who I am. I walk in with tears, they walk in with tears. It's hugs and love. Um, yoga teaches us not only to be grateful for um, what our body brings for us, but yoga also brings us together as a community to do more. And we do fun things, like run half marathons. <laughs> and these are a lot of people that did it for the first time. This is my daughter to the right of me, or to the right. This is her first half marathon at 13. She was watching the whole time. So grateful. And so, I got to be on the cover of a magazine. <laughs> that granted, it was the Ames Living magazine. I have no makeup on, I'm sweaty, my hair's pulled back in a bun, but there's no Photoshop going on. If the beauty is going to come, it needs to come from within. And to me, this is one of the proudest moments of my experience. Couldn't be more grateful. And so I also had the pleasure of working with the high school students, which has been one of the biggest joys of my life. 
Uh, I feel like by teaching the kids at a younger age to invite in mindfulness, to invite in presence, to breathe, to let go of what you look like on the outside and focus more on how you feel on the inside, if you can do it young, you can change the world. Definitely change yourself. Hey, how about this? <laughs> I, got, I get the opportunity to, to work with a lot of athletes, especially the Iowa State men's basketball team, which is super awesome because this is totally outside of their box, and somehow I get to be a small part of their training, which has been a huge highlight. And so finally, a few, year, a few years ago, I was recognized by Lululemon and asked to be an ambassador. If you're not familiar with Lululemon, I know they have some bad press, but they really changed their branding. They're an awesome health and wellness company, um, and I had the joy of being a part of it. And they did a campaign that said, replace pretty with powerful. And that so resonated with me. Because I feel like if you can replace the word pretty with powerful, especially as a woman, you can do whatever you put your mind to. It's really what's on the inside that counts. Hi everyone, my name is Grace Capun and I'm 16 years old. Um, some of you may know who I am, while others, others of you probably have no clue who I am. So I just wanted to start from the very beginning. In the fifth grade, while I was attending mass at my elementary school, I passed out. And honestly, I don't really remember anything from that day, except for the fact that I was being poked and prodded and picked at and stuff, and test after test. And, but then they just couldn't figure what was wrong with me. I dealt with incidents like this as well as what we found out to be chronic daily migraines after a couple months of dealing with them. These migraines would take a huge toll on me as I'd have to stay home from school two to three times a week. I was not only going in and out of the hospital throughout this time, but I was also worried about the other kids who had to stay at the hospital or something much more severe. So after I was released, I brought it up with my parents that I wanted to raise money for Blank Children's Hospital. But I was also 10 and I didn't know how to raise money because I couldn't get a job or I couldn't do anything. So I just decided to do a lemonade stand. That's actually Jamie Pollard. Um, so um, I would hold up a sign at the corner of my street saying 25 cent lemonade, all proceeds go to Blank Children. And after I just raised over a little over $100, I took my first check down to Blank Children's Hospital. And at that time, I never felt more excited and prouder of myself as I was doing something that I really wanted to do. When I was at Blank, I asked, how do you get your name on the donor wall? And they said that if you raise $1,000, you can get your name on the scrolling wall, and for $10,000, you can get a small brick. So I put my hands on my hip, and I said, I will be back. <laughs> people started reaching out to me to do lemonade stands and events for Blank Children's Hospital. This was a huge accomplishment and as, as, as I was so dedicated to helping so many kids at Blank. And not only did I put on a lemonade stands in the summer, I sold a hot chocolate when it got colder. And I also found a way to continue to donate even if it wasn't through Blank Children's Hospital. I actually started donating my hair multiple, <laughs> multiple times to places that needed it the most. <laughs> Um, as I started raising more money, my family and I made the decision to put on a 5K to help support the different areas in need at Blank. The first year we put together a 5K walk slash run in a month at Ada Haven here at Ames, and it was a lot of work and dedication, but the outcome was so amazing. Not only did I get multiple Iowa State athletic groups involved, I also got former Iowa State basketball players George Niang, Solomon Young, and Naz Long to attend and come out and support Blank Children's Hospital and they still come and help me every year. As the winter months approached, I was still determined to continue to raise money in some way for Blank Children's Hospital. So I had two ideas, and one was a coin drive, and the other was a toy drive at Christmas time. So, in middle school, I asked my math teachers if they would help me with a coin drive, and we were able to get the whole school involved for three years, and we were actually able to donate $10,000 from pennies dimes, and quarters. And now I know what many of you might be thinking, why a coin drive? It's 25 cents. The coins probably don't make a lot of money. But they, no matter if it's 25 cents, $25, $25,000, you're doing something pretty special. Putting on a toy drive over the holiday months was such an impactful experience, not only for me, but for the kids and their families at Blank. It is hard enough to be in the hospital at Christmas time, so it is nice to have a gift. I not only got businesses involved donating toys, but also got so many people around Ames to donate toys for the kids. It got to the point where we had to bring two separate cars 
full of toys down to play. Now that's just crazy. <laughs> but um, when I was 12, I was given the opportunity to speak in front of 500 people at the annual gala for Festival of Trees and Lights, which raises money for the Child Life Program at Lane. As a 12-year-old, I will say that was not easy. My family also decorated a tree for the festival of trees and lights that represented my 5K run, which is lemonade. These experiences not only helped me become a better speaker, but also a better leader. I was given these great opportunities to show people who I truly am and what I love to do, and that's what I did. Not only was I given opportunities to speak, but also I was also given opportunities to receive special awards that hold a special place in my heart. In 2018, I received the Outstanding Youth and Philanthropy Award, which was given to me by the AFP Central Iowa Chapter. Then, in March of 2019, I was granted the U.S. Cellular 16 Under 16 Award of $10,000, which I donated to Blank Children's Hospital. In eighth grade, I was later given the Timothy Ryan Jinks Memorial Scholarship at my school, and I donated the $1,000 to Blank Children's Hospital. I am currently the youngest person to have a brick with my name on it at Blank. And last year, I was able to have a room named after me at the New Star Development Center. If I'm being honest, that was probably the most touching thing that has ever happened to me throughout my whole fundraising experience because the Star Developmental Center holds such a big, impactful place in my heart and in so many people's hearts. This year is my fifth annual Amazing Grace Lemonade Race, and we were able to donate $31,824. And so far, I have donated over $107,000 to Blank Children's Hospital. And not only do I continue to hold a 5K walk slash run every year, but I also continue to try my best to get the community involved with something that means so much to me. When I raise money for Blake Children's Hospital, I don't think about how much money I raise. I think about how many children, parents, and families I impact when I raise the money. There's a quote I think about when I'm raising, my, when I'm raising money, and the quote is from Maya Angelou, which is, I have learned that people will forget what you said, People forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. I think about this quote quite often because it reminds me that no matter what I do, people will always remember how I made them feel and what I did to make them feel that way. There are many steps and levels in fundraising, and I'm just a very small part of this process. No matter how young or old you are, you are always evolving and are able to make a change in someone's life. So if you dream it, you believe it, you will do it. If you're looking to do something meaningful, but you're too afraid to do it, I'm going to tell you, just do it. <laughs> yes, it may be scary and difficult, but the outcome is so worth it. Thank you. She was talking and she kept saying she was a junior. I was like, oh, that's so wonderful, and you'll be graduating from Iowa State soon. She said, I'm a junior in high school. <laughs> creativity and entrepreneurship and business. Do I really do any of these things? I'm not quite sure, but I tell people all the time, I am in the business of changing lives. Originally, I'm from Flint, Michigan, and as you can see, I love a good suit. That's why I had on that wonderful suit in the first picture and this fabulous suit this evening. Thank you. Originally from Flint, Michigan, product of a single parent home. Not really supposed to make it. My mother was the first person in the college in our family to go away to college and was kind of ridiculed for doing it. Everybody else worked at General Motors. Was she too good to do that? But she encouraged me. I had to go away to school. So how did this average student, and I'll be very clear, I was average, go on to get a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, and ultimately a PhD? Well, I did it because I found my passion. I knew that I wanted to help others, but more importantly, I just wanted to prove a few people wrong. I wanted them to know I can be a leader. And so how do you lead when you pack up and you leave DC after 22 years and you come to Iowa State University? You leave everything you know and you move in the middle of a pandemic. Makes a lot of sense, right? We'll see. I pack up and I move here two days later, a derecho. <laughs> Is a duration. My family freaked out and so did I. 
I, was, I didn't know anybody. I was here. I had three days with no power, and I knew absolutely no one in the city. Had I really made the right decision? Hmm. Eventually, the school year begins, and I'm starting a new job and a new academic year, trying to create a new normal. But deep down in my heart, I knew there was nothing really normal about this. So how do you lead? How do you lead when you're meeting with students and they're asking you all sorts of questions, day in and day out? Why are we doing this? Why are we doing that? And you don't have the answers because you're asking yourself the very same question. How do you stand up in front of them with a straight face and say, we're gonna make it? And then sometimes at night, I'm laying in bed wondering, are we really gonna make it through this? What's gonna happen? And then the semester goes on. I tell people all the time, colleges are microcosms of the larger society. So when major things happen, they also find themselves, and we see it happening on campuses. So we're in the middle of a major political election, and we're seeing different students act out, post things, protest, and all sorts of things happening on campus. I was tired after that. How do you leave when you're tired? You go home. You surround yourself with people who love you. You wear matching pajamas at Christmas. It makes you feel good. You get your cup full. You think you're ready to come back after the holidays. And then one week after you get back, another major event hits. How do you lead in a time of turmoil? How do you balance your own emotions and feelings? when you worked inside that very building 25 years ago? How do you speak when you have a loss of words during this time, and how do you lead and explain it to the students? You move on to Black History Month, and here I am, the highest ranking person of color on this campus, so everyone looks at me and says, what should we do? You tell us what to do, you represent. But what can I really, truly say? The next month, we move into Women's History Month, and I'm excited about this panel. A whole presentation planned by students, but then the panel becomes writ with controversy because of a tweet that a woman of color made about Black History Month just the month before. People are looking at me wanting to know what I think, but do I really have the power to speak up? The next thing we know, thing that had us gripped and all watching our TVs just the summer before comes back up again. How do you lead when you're, you're battling with yourself what to say? And the university says, Dr. Younger, can you help us create a statement? We need to issue a statement to our campus. You make it to the end of the academic year, but now it's probably going to bring just as much uncertainty as the year prior. But how do you lead? How do you lead when there's tons of questions being asked? You're doing the hard work to prepare for these students to come back and return, but you're struggling with your own internal battles, your own questions, your own anxieties, your own uncertainties. How are we gonna be able to do X? What's gonna happen if Y happens? Where are we and what is this going to look like? August rolls around. How do you leave when 31,000 human beings return to Ames, Iowa? They're excited, but they're anxious. Their parents are coming up to you saying, is my child going to be safe? What's going to happen if? And you're battling and struggling with your own thoughts during this time. This, my friends, is how you leave. First and foremost, you put your big girl pants on. <laughs> you recognize it's not about you. It's about the students that you serve each and every day. You lead by example. You dig deep from within to figure out what it is that they need to hear. You remember the prize at the end. You face those fears head on. You celebrate the small victories along the way. You lead with the support of others because there's no way we can do this type of work alone. You lead knowing that you're a part of a very important team. 
And because this is She Talks and I'm feeling real woman power, <laughs> I'm so proud to be part of a team that's led by a woman. And the support that she gives me each and every single day makes my job just a little bit easier. And so ultimately, leadership can be hard. And I will be very clear, it is not for the faint of heart. <laughs> but it takes faith, determination, strength, courage, wisdom, and support from others. We cannot do this work alone, and you definitely can't lead in a time of crisis by yourself. I am convinced that every single person in this room is a leader. You just not, may not know it yet. Thank you. I'm going to start the presentation the same way I start every presentation, and that's with the question, how many of you have ever eaten an insect on purpose? Raise those hands high. How many of you are totally grossed out by the thought of eating insects? I'm not offended. Please raise your hand. <laughs> cool. But for those of you who just raised your hand and might be ruining your day a little bit, did you know that the average American accidentally eats one to two pounds of insects every year of the food that they eat? Do you eat food? Do you eat insects? Sorry about it. My name is Shelby Smith, and I am the owner of Do Eat Crickets. I have been raising bugs and convincing people to eat them varying degrees of success since 2018. Believe it or not, did not grow up wanting to be a cricket farmer. I don't know anyone who does. I would love that person. That being said, I did grow up on a farm here in Ames, Iowa. Wanted nothing to do with Iowa, nothing to do with the farm. Luckily, I was pretty good at basketball, so I ended up earning a full scholarship to St. Joseph's University in Philadelphia, where I got a finance degree. Went over to Ireland, kept playing, got a master's degree in finance. Worked as an equity derivatives trader, soon figured out, did not want to be in finance. Are you sensing a theme here? <laughs> things I don't necessarily want to do. So I ended up, after three and a half years, handing in my notice, moving back to the farm. That's me in farm equipment. Skin steer. I look terrified. There's a reason. That's my nephew, who was four at the time, and he would run circles around me. Needless to say, I was growing corn and soybeans with my dad. Definitely shouldn't have been doing that. I wasn't really interested. <laughs> but it was better than investment banking. So here I was. My dad and I, I we finished a harvest together, and we ended up getting a gift box full of maple syrup. If you guys haven't checked it out, go check them out. Uh, that then suggested the idea of a niche market, niche agriculture. What could I do? My parents never thought I'd come up with crickets, but here we are. So fast forward about three weeks, and I sent both my parents an article about a woman raising crickets for human consumption. 10 days later, I bought my first 10,000 crickets. These are my first 10,000 crickets. That's a two-week-old cricket. I didn't know they were that small when I first got them. That's a whole different story that will not fit into 20 seconds. But let's just say that I learned how to raise crickets on YouTube, and uh, that was as successful as I'm sure it sounds. The other thing that I had to figure out after I figured out how to raise these crickets, though, was how to cook with them. Anybody in here know how to cook with bugs? Cool, neither did I. You can learn, too. So anyway, so figured out, not on YouTube, how to cook crickets, but I figured out by trial and error how to cook crickets, and then I had to figure out where the heck I was going to sell them. Ames has a really cool farmer's market director. Some of you in here are lucky enough to know her. Some of you aren't. Her name is Lo Jean. I sent her an email. I said, hey, can I sell crickets at your farmer's market? <laughs> and she sent me an email back and said, weird, but sure. <laughs> This girl right here, his sister, she was down for it. Um, I will tell you in three years of selling at markets and all of that, that's very common, three to one, females to males who will try cricket for the first time. Males <laughs> Anyways, ended up selling out of every single cricket I raised in 2018, so I had to expand. I was raising those crickets in my dad's shop. I needed to build the cricket castle. That's my cricket castle. Uh, so that's the ribbon cutting. Be careful with those scissors, they're actually very sharp. That being said, and if you've seen my dad since then, he's got long hair and looks like a hippie, which is really weird for him. But anyway, so I expanded. 2019 was a really busy year for me, so I built that cricket castle. I bought this building on Main Street in Collins, Iowa, if any of you know where it is. Brownie points to you. Uh, ended up turning that into a licensed food processing facility. So then at that point, I could be on grocery store shelves, online store, all of those things. A little tiny town of less than 500 people. You can think I'm really weird, but it's cool. So the other thing I did in 2019 is I ran out of crickets again. Even though I had my cricket castle, still needed more. Ended up bringing on four contract growers from 2019 to 2020. These were my first two guinea pigs. I love them very much. Sometimes I don't think that they love me, but it's okay. So they raise crickets for me. I provide the feed. They, I buy them from them and take them and process them into the final product. 
The other thing I did is I launched my online store, finally. I ended up shipping to all 50 states from the end of 2019 to, we'll call it March of this last year. Anybody in here from West Virginia? This is my point. This was my last state to get. <laughs> it was West Virginia. Nobody goes in, nobody comes out. I'm totally convinced of it, but we finally got one. Of 2020, landed on my first grocery store shelves, which was Wheatsfield. Had no idea what I was doing. Also brought on my third grower. Cool. This is the end of February. The world has not fallen apart yet. Everything's great. Um, 2020 became quite a challenge right about then. Um, so I had tripled my supply chain, and then global pandemic set in. All of that being said, with all that happened, still ended up on 100 shelves across the U.S. at various different stores. As of today, I am in about 50 different IVs in five states, um, and all of those little specialty stores, I find them through various platforms. And at this point, you guys might be going, okay, this is all cool, but why would I eat crickets? Uh, so, high in protein, calcium, iron, B12, prebiotic fiber, all of that doesn't matter, though, if they taste like crap. I don't, I personally hate salmon. I know it's great for me but it tastes like crap to me, so I won't eat it. So I make sure that all of my crickets are absolutely delicious. So my best sellers are my, my roasted crickets, smoky barbecue in particular. If you haven't tried one yet, there's bags of them over there. The very first question that I get from everyone is what the heck do these taste like? Sunflower seeds or the crumbs at the bottom of the chip bag? If you have any mental problems with it, just think sunflower seeds and knock it back. Tell me if I'm wrong. That's what I have. The other thing I have, for those of you who are not into the visual of the whole bug, I have cricket bars. They have the cricket powder. They're ground up and mixed in. If you think you find a cricket in there, you are wrong. That is sunflower seed. So, <laughs> over there. I put lemon in the slide because lemon's my favorite, and this is my presentation, so my favorite goes in there. You can always order apple cinnamon. Apple cinnamon are good, too. So I have the cricket bars for those who are a little more uh, on edge about the whole bug thing. Um, if you want to know how many crickets are in it, rampant in my industry that eating bugs are going to save the world and solve all of our problems. <laughs> no, they are not. That being said, what I really do hope that I use bugs for is opening a wider conversation of when is the last time you thought about why you eat what you eat? And when is the last time you thought about how that food on your plate got to your plate? And above all else, Please don't yuck my yum. If you've never tried my crickets, don't tell me how gross you think they are, because you don't know. You have no idea. Does anybody know what Pop-Tarts, Twinkies, and Spam all have in common? The bugs in them. No. <laughs> probably, probably have bugs in them, but more importantly, foreigners find them absolutely disgusting. They are on the top 10 most disgusting food list. So don't yuck my yum if you've never tried it. At this point, those of you who raised your hand, has anybody changed their mind? Yeah. Would you consider eating crickets now? I see some heads on it. That is all I have. Great. And you can put your money where your mouth is and try it. Thank you.